Pelicans, man, get their fourth win in a row, which if you're a Pelicans fan, that is rare and that feels good. If you're starting 1-12, and 12, they are now 21-20 and 20 since that start. Um, they're up to 10th place in the Western Conference standings and a just wonderful Tuesday for Pelicans fans. The Lakers get their ass kicked. Pelicans win a game. They're now just three and a half back from L.A. in that ninth seed. I mean, bruh, it is... Um, it's really good right now, but what you witnessed last night, Jake, and we can talk about the game itself and the win and everything, but the story to me, I've never seen anything like this. I don't know if you have, but the story is about the culture that Willie Green is building. In case yeah. you missed it yesterday, they trade for C.J. McCollum, huge trade, uh, involved in that trade are two beloved Pelicans, Nikhail Alexander-Walker and Josh Hart. Uh, well, so they get the news that they've been traded they actually showed up at last night's game sitting courtside as fans. Hart was there the whole game. He had an Ingram jersey on. Uh, Nall was there for the second half. It was a very emotional moment after the game where they're hugging their teammates, saying goodbye. But, Jake, if that isn't a testament to the bonds that Will that, that Willie Green is forging, I mean, I have never seen a play, players that just get traded like that are normally salty as hell. They're normally yeah. angry. They normally get the hell out. I have never seen players show up to the game that night to pay homage to their teammates. No, usually you're exactly right. Like when you get released, when you get traded, whatever it is from that team, like you want nothing to do with that team. You have to step away from that team for a couple of weeks, months before you can even feel the same about your time spent there. I know for me personally, when I got released by San Diego, I was like, I, I don't, I want nothing to do with the Chargers. Yeah. N- absolutely nothing. And then now you are hearing me talking about the Bush League Bolts all the time, right? But initially you're so mad at everyone because yeah. you feel like, okay, why, why am I the one that's being released or why am I the one that's being traded? But this is something special. I've never seen this before. Yeah, no, dude, my old man hated the Saints for years because Jim Finks and everything. He never hated the actual, you know, the 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 team or the fan base or the idea. He always loved Louisiana. He always wanted to come back to Louisiana. But he was not happy with the Saints front office uh, for many, many, many years. And it took a while to get over that. And, again, I think this all traces back to Willie Green. And because look, David Griffin, um, and we're gonna talk about Griffin. I think we probably owe Griffin an apology. He, he he's done some really impressive stuff here as of late that we'll break down. But uh David Griffin has been there for a few years and this culture was not like this, right? This all traces back to the very young first year head coach that you took a chance on. And I think uh Will Gillery actually wrote about that, saying, uh, or here here's a Brandon Ingram quote that I like and, and, and again after the Van Gundy nonsense of last year where he was so out of touch and everybody hated his coaching style and nothing was working it has to feel amazing for this young team it says quote it starts with Willie just his positive message every single day and him telling us to stick with each other we want the best for each other and it shows and I think that's true they really actually do want the best for each other. And you can see that. And you saw that last night. I've never seen that before. And this is something that I was thinking about this morning, which is how important it is for the Pelicans to have this success and build these bonds and build this culture without Zion. And I don't mean that as a negative towards Zion. I feel like one of the issues during the AD era, Jake, was that AD was always fully aware that everything was on his shoulders, right? Yeah. And that he had all the leverage, he had all the power. That the Pelicans needed him more than he needed us. And that, look, that, and when we think about that, we're like, oh, well, that's a good spot to be in, right? That's empowering. You are yeah. the man. And I guess an element to that's true, but when you're a young player, it can also be debilitating, right? right. Yeah. Like, that's a lot of pressure heaped onto your shoulders when you're 19 years old and you're trying to figure out how to be a professional, all these different things. Like, all of a sudden, you who's never played in the NBA, you are burdened with lifting up this dysfunctional franchise. Like, that can breed resentment. And you saw that with AD. I think it did breed resentment. So, I think a much more desirable situation is being a part of an organization that knows itself, that is successful, where you're not the man. Where you have a role and you fit in in that role and then you prove on merit rather than just being handed that you prove on merit that you deserve to have a larger role, that you can be the guy. And so, again, I, I'm treating Zion like we're treating Mike Thomas. It's just a added bonus yeah. if you get him, great. Uh, but I think for him, 
Some some would try to paint it, oh, they're having all this success without him. I bet you he's mad or this or that or whatever. I don't think that's the case. I think this actually makes it all much more desirable for him because it takes a lot off of his plate. Yeah, so if you look at this in, again, meathead NFL terms, okay, when you're a rookie quarterback, right, if you're Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson, you're going to that situation where Oof. you've got to be the guy. Yeah. You are the face of the franchise. You have to be the guy that leads us to the promised land. Not every first round pick has that, right? It's a very, it's a luxury, a very big luxury if you can get the opposite and still be the starter, a la Mac Jones. Mac Jones finished his season in the Pro Bowl, right? He Which, was, he was a, he was a mid round pick uh, there in the first round, and he came into a situation where he was the starter, but it all didn't fall on him. Yeah, he could just be whoever he wanted to be within the system. He could be a piece of it, and then by the end of the season, he became a bigger piece of it. He became a guy that could lead them with others helping him and not solely on him. So it's kind of that situation. If Zion was you know, able to come back, then he doesn't have to be necessarily the, the, the guy that just does it all. Now, he's a superstar when he plays, so he's going to be a big key of it. But they've got Ingram. They're going to have McCall, and They're going to have Jackson Hayes. They're going to have other pieces, so he can just be a piece that helps, and he can slowly rise to the top yeah. of whatever they're trying to do. I mean, he, he's, he's your number three. Uh, when he comes back initially, now obviously with how he played and what he was doing, like probably bullies his way into uh, maybe being the number one, or you know, time will tell. But yeah, right now it feels like it's going to be Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum, and then um, I, I, I guess uh, if you had to give a big three as the roster stands today, including McCollum, is are you, are you throwing Valanciunas? Valanciunas is the third. Valanciunas then Herb. He kind of okay, just yeah. described Herb Jones's journey to the NBA. Like he was a second round pick. He was supposed to contribute sparingly, but he stepped up and has been a starter and has been honestly one of the best defensive players in the league. Like that's not a stretch to say yeah. that. I thought he was going to say Najee Marshall. Uh, Najee had a good game last I night. I know he did, and I thought <laughs> nothing but Mario. Playing time opened up for my man. Josh Hart <laughs> off the team, Nikhil off the team. More Najee minutes. But, yeah. hey, two two things I got to say. Yeah. Number one, shout out to Josh Hart before anything. That yeah. man was such a professional since he was traded from the Lakers. He always gave it his all, regardless of what the Pels' record was, regardless of what the score was. I'm going to miss watching him play for the Pelicans straight up. And then as far as David Griffin goes, if you're a Pelicans fan coming into this season, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Check it out, Flock Up, Guarantee Podcast Network. But coming into this year, David Griffin would kind of still talk a lot about family and growing organically, and you cringe whenever he says that as yeah. a Pelicans fan because <laughs> the last two seasons have been the opposite. But now all that garbage about growing organically and family, it's looking less like garbage. Like it's looking like it's actually coming into fruition. And they're still 11 games below 500. They're 10th place in the conference. And to a casual fan, it sounds pathetic if you're getting excited about that. But when you read into the context of what this team has been through, it's really impressive that they are where they are right now. Absolutely. Context matters. You can't ignore climbing, having to climb out of the 1-12 and start to now being playoff relevant and, in fact, kind of nipping at the Los Angeles Lakers' heels, right, with LeBron James and Russell Westbrook and Anthony Davis. And here the Pelicans sit with Valanchunas and Brandon Ingram just three and a half games back with not even a tenth of the name power, the star power. I mean, it definitely feels like there are some narrative momentum. You know, the basketball gods, uh, there's, there's, there's a movie script in the works where this all ends with the Pelicans topping, toppling 80s Lakers. Um, I, I, time will tell. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But it's certainly starting to have that sort of feel. Uh, look, so CJ McCollum is going to arrive in New Orleans today. What a great birthday present for the resident Pelican apostate. Myself, as I uh, come back to the church of the Pelican after maybe losing my way over the past few months. Uh, but CJ McCollum arriving today. Uh, David Griffin saying last night on the broadcast, he wants him on the court tomorrow. Yeah. And what's great for Pelicans fans, and we're always talking about the Pelicans trying to gain mind and heart share and you know get the fans excited uh, there's five home games in a row. Five home games in a row. It's the cheapest ticket in the entire NBA in terms of, like, you can get lower bowl seats sometimes for, like, 10, 15 bucks, even less at other times. Uh, you can go watch McCullough play now that he's in a Pelican uniform. You can watch this team that's won four in a row, making noise. Brandon Ingram, who's playing just on fire right now. It's a great ticket, and they're home five games in a row, starting with the Heat tomorrow night. It's, uh, it's finally time to start cracking those illegal streams again. <laughs> I, I always said it was going to be an effort thing of when they of when they could like kind of uh, when would the product become attractive enough to where you want to go into 
sketchy sites full of pop-ups and warnings and you know pressing play and then xing back out and pressing play again and all all of that just crap but i'm willing to wait through that crap once again i can give you my login uh for for the pelicans uh okay i was thinking about you yeah chance offered me the i know same my thing. brother offered you the same thing the hesters are trying to get you not to have the lime wire type uh viruses on your computer that's fair and, and that, that that will probably be i guess i'm just a little um I'm a little doubtful that DirecTV is not probably stingy as hell with their login info, right? I'm, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to be all like, oh, that ISP isn't yours, and then I don't want to screw up your account. We'll figure it out. For you, I'll stay off the uh, DirecTV during the Pelicans game so you can watch it. <laughs> uh, okay, dude. Look, hell yeah. That's a, that's a good birthday present. I think, boys, I mean, I'll speak for myself here. Um, I think I owe David Griffin an apology. And... It's so funny because ultimately, what what does this all prove, right? Winning's the only thing that matters, right? And then whether you win or not is how we're going to judge all your decisions. And rightfully so, this should be the case. But it has to be a bit frustrating for guys like Griffin, not that they give this the time of the day, but there it, it has to be a bit frustrating to hear guys like me who can't even tell you the difference between like a 2-3 zone and a 3-2 zone beyond the fact that, you know, how the defenders line up basically, like, to me, pontificate about, this guy sucks. This guy doesn't know basketball. What are these moves that he's making? When now, in the end, DJ's looking pretty strong. And uh, look, y'all know I love Evan Sachs on Twitter. One of the best follows at Evan Sachs. Um, but he kind of nailed it here. He says, so, David Griffin turned Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday, two great players, into Brandon Ingram, C.J. McCollum, Jonas Valanciunas, Devontae Grant, Herb Jones, Larry Nance, Jackson Hayes, and Garrett Temple. It's pretty damn strong. And that is facts. That they can't be argued with. And then I guess there's some people responding to that saying, uh, oh, I mean, yeah, but but AD and Drew went on to win rings, right? So, like, you waste of a... He says, if any more of you MFers try to dunk on this by saying AD and Drew run rings, I'm blocking you into the ether. Guess what? They asked to be traded, which is a key point. They should send David Griffin thank you cards for sending him to the perfect destination. Do you think this is somehow his fault? Again, a lot of their discontent was the pre-David Griffin era. Drew and AD are good, but they won 33 games in 2018-19. The Pelicans are currently on pace to hit that exact same mark before acquiring C.J. McCollum, and that's without the human bowling ball <laughs> playing all season. Spare me your BS. This team is better than that team. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's all objective fact. Hard to argue with. You turn those two players into that full list that the current team has made, basically into the entire team. Turn those yeah, players I'd say, into yeah. this entire current team. Again, like he said, they asked to be traded. There was no keeping them. You even send them to places where they both get rings, so they're happy. Like, David Griffin kind of did the impossible breakup thing where all sides kind of walk away and everybody feels pretty good about it. Yeah, and you've also locked up some of this talent as well. It's not just, you know, a one-and-done type situation or even two seasons. And so he's done that part of it as well. The next step is to figure out what to do with Zion, though. Like, that's going to be the next step because you have a really nice core right now. Like, you have a nice core and a nice basketball team that's starting to find their way. But you're always going to have that elephant in the room, I think, until you figure out that situation. Yeah. Now, I don't know what you do with that situation, Obviously, he's got a history of injuries dating all the way back to Duke. I, like, I don't know his value right now. So you don't even know, like, what his value would be because he hasn't been on the court. So you don't want to just give away somebody that when he's on the court, I mean, he's 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 almost on the, on the verge of generational type guy. Yeah, I mean, we've yeah, never really sure. seen anybody like Zion and what he can do. So obviously, you're going to hold on to that piece for as long as you can. But also, like, you want to you want to figure it out just because – like me, like I'm the person that brought it up. Every time we talk about the Pelicans and all this goodwill, it's like, okay, but what are we going to do with the elephant in the room? The guy that's supposed to be the face of the franchise. So that's it's something that's going to have to be addressed. And if they make the postseason, they make a run, that would be a fantastic story. But it's still going to be, okay, that's great. What do you do with Zion? So yeah. Zion's almost assuredly going to be back next season. He's on his rookie contract. That means yeah. after his fourth season, he's a restricted free agent. The only way he's unrestricted is if he takes his player option, plays a fifth season, and then after that, he's unrestricted. But doing that would leave so much money yeah. on the table. And he, like you're saying, hasn't really shown that he's worth that. So if I had to speculate, I would think he's still going to get a max offer, but it might have some type of provisions in it. Like 
you have to play a certain number of games. That's what happened with Joel Embiid. He yeah. didn't play his first full two seasons in the NBA. It was similar concerns. Yeah. But he's, you would think he's going to be back at least for next season. And this is the team, though. You don't have any more cap flexibility bringing in C.J. McCollum. Like, that is your team. Zion, Brandon Ingram, C.J. McCollum. Everything's going to be. a good team. Yeah, on the surface at least. But it's also a different challenge for C.J. McCollum. He's going to be the primary guard kind of for the first time in his career. He's always been the number two guy to Damian Lillard. So it's a big adjustment for him as well. But on the surface, it is promising. And you would think Zion's going to be back for at least one more year. Like, in, in an absolute worst-case scenario, he wants to leave New Orleans no matter what. Like, let's assume that's his number one priority. He still probably wants to sign that max extension and then force his way out in a couple of years during his second contract, like yeah. Anthony Davis did. Yeah, and, 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 and again, I think I would just I would just continue to say as a Pelicans fan, um, you can always have those conversations because they're fun to think about, but like, I would just kind of largely ignore him until, uh, I mean, he's out of sight, out of mind, you know? He's out in L.A. or Oregon, or I think he's in Portland, actually. I, I can say that is hard to do. It, it is hard, especially when you're struggling. I, I mean, I haven't had the, the, the level of Zion players sit out, but there was multiple times in San Diego that we had teammates that we absolutely loved, but they were holding out. Yeah. And we were like 500. We're like, man, if we had this guy, if we had that guy. We had two guys holding out in the same year, and you want to try to move on. You want to try to do everything you can, but it's like, in the back of your mind, if you're not, if it's not going extremely well, even if it's going well, you're still, you know, man, gosh, if we just had Zion, imagine where we'd be right now. Like you do have that feeling. It's hard to not talk about them just because you know, they're supposed to be there, right? Yeah. You know, they're supposed to be there and they're not there. And even if you, again, if you really enjoy that teammate, it's still something where you have a little bit of, of this bitterness because you're like, I understand you're doing what you have to do for you, but for the team, if you were here, we'd be we wouldn't be eight and eight. We'd be ten and six. Yeah, and if everybody's winning, then everybody has a better chance of keeping their job, and then the whole yeah. building's happier, and everything is better. So, and I think early in the season, you saw a lot of that. Like this is not our team. We're kind of waiting on Zion to come save us. But yeah. then they took the mentality of he's going to come back when he comes back, and this is our team. And you see that coming to fruition with the twenty-two and twenty record the last forty games. So uh, Nookie asked a pretty good question, which is like, are we like Lucy? Are we Charlie Brown right now? Lucy putting that ball down again. Every time. And here we are running up, and we about to get pulled. I'm going to keep on kicking that thing for the rest of the time. <laughs> well, yeah, that's fair. Swinging at it. Not really, no, yes. no, you don't kick it. Until we make contact. <laughs> Until make contact. we will make contact. I do think this. I think there are a couple of critical differences between this and the past. And I would say it, the, the, the main thing all goes back to Willie Green, right? It's, it's about what we talked about, the culture, everything else, the scene last night. Uh, but it's also the... It's also the fact that when I look at a team that had Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday and won 33 games, that is an era of Pelican basketball where also you had retread head coaches that had actually objectively bad records like in their time, mm -hmm. in their career. But that's an era of basketball where you consistently underachieve. This team right here is overachieving. If you were to look at their talent and how we would think about how it fits into the rest of the NBA and what they should be able to do with that talent – so that's a sign of good coaching. That's something that has not been there before when Lucy's put down that football. Again, the winds of fate can shift quickly, right? Like, here we are, winners of four in a row. We're praising David Griffin, C.J. McCollum's. Everything's coming up, Pels. Go on a Lucy streak, and everybody will be claiming, oh, it's over again. They suck and all of this stuff, right? So we will see where it ends up going out. When we get back, we dive a little bit into this Dennis Allen press conference, and we got to play uh, what happened in Fayetteville last night as uh, the Hogs were running wild, literally, all over the court. Keep it locked off the bench.